We are uh, working our way through, well, the last number of weeks on the person and work of the Holy Spirit, but it's part of a larger study, in case you've forgotten the basic systematic outline of Christian belief. This is uh, 44 weeks we've been doing this. It will go until roughly, give or take, maybe when we have the summer shut down. When's that in? Ladder. Isn't he funny? Just so funny. The summer shutdown, which is in June. So I think the third Sunday in June or something, we do the church picnic, and uh, and that's the last Christian ed class. So we will probably wrap up this series. So it will have taken us about a year altogether to go through... Uh, to go through this stuff. Somebody else probably could have done it in a month, but it takes me a year. It's just the way it is. And so we've been studying the person and work of the Holy Spirit, and specifically we've been looking at the gifts of the Spirit as they're listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I took a week, almost two weeks actually, describing the different categories of gifts 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, and how I thought that was significant. The idea for that came out of verses 4, 5, and 6 of 1 Corinthians 12, where it says there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. That's what we're studying now, the gifts of the Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So you have the Trinity involved, the categories of gifts. We looked at all of that. Now we're jumping down. And we're in actually verse 10. It starts in verse, in verse uh, 8, really. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. We looked at that. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles. We looked at those. To another prophecy. That's where we are. We started last week and uh, we'll finish up prophecy this week. And what we're looking at this week is not just analyzing the gift of prophecy, but also studying the purpose of prophecy in the church today. Is it, is it necessary? I mean, there's a whole school, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of reform teaching, a lot of Baptist teaching, and I'm not, I'm not knocking your church background if that's where you come from. I'm simply saying there's a whole school of thought uh, quite uh, briskly taught that there is no purpose of the gift of prophecy today. That in essence, it's done. It's done because, well, it's done because we have this. We have the Bible. And so they go to uh, 1 Corinthians 13, I think very mistakenly, when that which is perfect come, then that which is a part will be done away. And, And some of them actually interpret that which is perfect to be the Bible, which clearly when you read the context, there's just no way on earth that it's the scriptures. It's, it's talking about when Jesus comes again. And the implication of that passage in 1 Corinthians 13 is that the gifts of the Spirit, it proves the exact opposite of what they, they think because what it, in fact, teaches is the gifts of the Spirit are valid until Jesus comes back through the whole church age. Um, all, that doesn't imply that there aren't a lot of goofy things that people do, but that doesn't mean that the gifts themselves aren't valid for the church age. And so the purpose of prophecy, because a lot of people would feel there is no real purpose for it. Um, some people just, whenever, whenever they see anything like that happen, whenever they see a gifts of the Spirit, or, or for that matter, verbal praise or lifting of hands, anything, anything that involves the body in a function other than listening, that somehow, well, that's just a display of the flesh, and, and it, it just gets so unfair. It gets so unfair, because... because If you say that the gift of prophecy has no purpose because now we have the scriptures, what I, what I would say is, but, but it's the scriptures <laughs> that talk about the gift of prophecy. See, I'm not the one belittling the scriptures. If you say the gift of prophecy has no place in the church today, you're the one who doesn't take the scriptures seriously because there's nothing in the Bible that would indicate that the gift of prophecy isn't for the church today. It's just a theological bias. And they, and they, and they uh, back it up by this, this 
false pumping up of their devotion to just the word. Just the word, Pastor Don. Well, it's the word that talks about how, how I, want, I want everyone everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting in prayer and praise. It's the word that talks about, about do not forbid speaking in tongues. It's the word that talks about prophecy being good for edifying and building up the body. It's the word that talks about praying in the spirit. It's the word that talks about shout to the Lord. It's the word that talks about lifting your voice in song. For goodness sake, if you, t if you believe this book at all, then there is place for actual involvement in ministry in the worship life of the congregation of the body of Christ. And if you rule that out, then you don't take this book seriously and stop pretending you do. Okay, I might have leaned on that a little hard. <clears throat> the purpose of prophecy. Point number one. Let me just read. When you start to study what was actually said in prophetic utterances in the New Testament, you make a surprising discovery. And here's the discovery. There's a glaring lack of recording mess recorded messages of prophecy in the New Testament. I mean, you've got Agabus, you know, and what he says to Paul. And Paul doesn't listen to him. There's, <laughs> there's the rub there. You've got Agabus and his little prophetic utterance, Paul, don't, when you go to Jerusalem, here's what they're going to do to you. And he ties up his hands and he shows them, this is what's going to happen to you, Paul. Don't, don't go. But other than that, you'll look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and go to the end of the book of Revelation, which is a prophetic book, I get it. But I'm talking about a gift of prophecy by someone in a congregational setting. And you won't find anything ever recorded of what was said. And I believe that's on purpose. I believe that helps us right off the bat, that helps us understand the purpose of prophecy. And what it says right off the bat is prophecy was never inserted into sacred text because prophecy doesn't have the same governing effect for the church that the recorded biblical text has. And I think we're made to make that mental connection by the absence of recorded prophecies in the scripture. I can't tell you the number of times someone has said to me, sometimes there'd be a message in prophecy, a word of prophecy. I don't like the word message. I don't like message in tongues, and I don't like a message in prophecy, personally. I can't prove that all from the scripture. I just, a prophetic word. Sometimes there'll be one, and someone will come up to me, and they'll say something like this. Is that, um, when you have like uh, the recording of the sermon and some of the worship and stuff, is that going to be on there? I really think we should have, I really think we should have that. And then they'll say something like this. In fact, I think what you should do is collect prophetic words that are given in small group settings, in Wednesday settings, in Sunday settings, and you should put them all on a CD. So we've got all these things. And at the end of the year, we can just hear all these prophecies. And they're usually surprised when I say something like this. I would never in a million years do that. I would never in a million years do that. Because, because it would betray a total lack of understanding of what the gift of prophecy is. And that gets into the second paragraph. The scriptural purpose, I'm in the middle of that second paragraph. The scriptural purpose of prophetic utterance is to address something local and something immediate which is what bothers me when you see Christian bookstores because they sell like hotcakes, which is why Christian bookstores carry them. They sell like crazy when you've got some prophet in Kansas City or Dallas or somewhere that has a, a vision or something like that or a prophetic word, and wham, you slap it into a book and you got two million sold. And some prophet somewhere just bought a Learjet and the church doesn't get it. Because... Whenever there's a prophetic word, it is given for that specific moment in that specific situation. Whereas if I read, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, I can talk about that text. I can talk about it in Newmarket. I can take my Bible and go to Hong Kong. I can go to Afghanistan. It can be in 1947. It can be 2013. 
And if somebody else does it and the Lord tarries and it's in 2089, they will always be able to take that. It will always be true and it will always be for everyone. That is not the case of a word of prophecy. A word of prophecy is for a specific situation, a specific insight from the Lord for a specific in situation in a specific local place. It's different from preaching. It's different from the general scriptural truth uh, on prayer, holiness, doctrine, evangelism. Prophecy is something that's revealed specifically for the need of the moment. I moved here September 24th, 1982. I landed here on a Friday, I believe, a Friday. No, I landed here on a Friday uh, late afternoon and Friday night got in my car and drove up to a men's retreat way up some godforsaken <laughs> I'm sorry my bias against northern Ontario is is coming out bunch of mosquitoes black flies and uh, somehow we were getting close to God up there so came to the house we were renting at that time 66 Kingston Road my wake up to Ontario was we lived in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan while I was going to Bible school and then afterwards when I was on staff at the church in a, a government subsidized uh, town housing unit. None of you would even live there. Really old, dumpy looking thing. The, the neat thing about it was I lived there with my utilities included for uh, 97 bucks a month, which seemed like a smart move. I should never have left 97 bucks a month. <laughs> Lived there for a number of years. And uh, yeah, 97 bucks a month. Remember, no, this is 1982. Moved to Newmarket, 66 Kingston Road, rented a place for $827 a month. And I thought, okay, like, are you just nuts? Like, what? Landed in the afternoon, dropped Rini, Melissa, Laurel got in the car, drove up to speak at the men's retreat. Uh, came back Sunday, came back Sunday afternoon. While I'm away, uh, Friday night, first night, first night in Ontario, and Rini's in bed, Melissa's in bed, Laurel's in a crib, and uh, Rini wakes up. She wakes up at about 2 in the morning. And uh, she hears the door. She thinks it's me. And so she looks at the door to her bedroom. So now in the house, hall light on, and she sees, because she doesn't have her contacts or her glasses, she just sees a person. And she, and she goes, what are you doing home? And then she realizes it's not me. The guy had broken into the house. There's a guy. There's a guy standing in the doorway to my wife's bedroom. The first night in Ontario. She did not like Ontario for a long time. <laughs> she screams and screams, of course. Uh, the guy thankfully runs. Melissa Laurel don't even wake up. Um, Rini doesn't know if he's left the house or not. Because we're moving into the house, there's stuff all over. She was putting up pictures. There's a hammer. So you can picture Rini in her nightgown with a hammer. And she's going out. <laughs> and I was so thankful the way everything ended up, obviously. I came back Sunday afternoon. And, and oh, by the way, Rini phoned, gets the phone in the bedroom, calls my dad then. Dad comes over to the house. Rini won't leave the bedroom. Dad goes through all the closets, makes sure there's nobody in there. Locks up. I find out later. This, by the way, is not just a story. It relates to the idea of, of prophecy being related to a specific moment in a specific situation. Okay? So my mom and dad, who lived 40 William Row, those condominiums on William Row, my mom wakes up exactly two o'clock she wakes up at two o'clock and she wakes up dad and just says 
We have to pray for Rini right now. Just have to pray for Rini right now. And so they get up and they're praying. They pray for Rini. They don't know what. They don't know why. Go back to bed and it's like five minutes later that the phone rings and there's Rini's quivering voice. Now, word of knowledge, prophecy, you can draw the lines if you want. I don't, I don't personally think they're that geometrically precise. But that's what I mean where God just, God speaks And it's for here and now, and it's for this situation. And here's what I mean. No disrespect for God's word at all. There's not a verse in the Bible that tells you to do that. Okay? There's not a verse in the Bible that's going to say, this Friday, 2 o'clock, you need to pray for Rini Horbin. Now, there was nothing contrary to Scripture in what was revealed to my mom. Okay? But it's not the same as Scripture. Now, we don't write that down you know, in the back of the Bible and make it like biblical text, but it's still something very precious when that happens, okay? And it's not wacky, goofy, spooky, weird, or anything else. That's what I mean by prophecy being for a specific local situation and an immediate need. A situation could arise in a prayer meeting where someone speaks out as the Lord directs and says, I feel we should pray right now for the missionaries in such and such a place in Uganda. Later on, we hear that on that very night there was intense military persecution. I've been in situations where that's happened. Or somebody offers a specific word of encouragement not really knowing to whom it was specifically intended. Later, some reports that they were considering suicide. I've been in situations like that too. All of those are just examples, and they're not perfect. But the point is, prophecy speaks to that moment. Next Sunday, it will be out of date. All right? It's not for the whole season of the church. This is for the whole season of the church. Preaching is for the whole season of the church. Teaching is for the whole season of the church. Prophecy is just for a moment. It's just for a slice in time, a specific need that no one would know how to address had God not revealed something definite in a specific way. Any questions on that before I race on to something else? You all okay? Okay. Uh, Two. The source of prophecy. Prophecy differs from teaching in that it is not the result of personal study or research. It is not something the speaker had planned to say at all. Prophetic inspiration, while not on the same level as scriptural revelation, is directly mediated by the Spirit of God. So, so when I, when I preach, when I teach, um, you know, it, it takes, it takes hours and hours going over sources, reading the text, going over commentaries, seeing the meaning, finding application. You, you work all that out depending on the Holy Spirit. But it's that joint effort of a lot of human work relying on the Holy Spirit. And boy, is it ever hot in here. Is it, is, am I, is it just me? It is, isn't it? Bill, don't listen to any of them. Just bump it down one or two, okay? Yes. I should be preaching like on hell. You people think it's hot in here right now. Let me... What was I talking about? <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, so, so when you prepare, you, you, you work hard and it's, it's, it's your efforts relying on the Lord, prayerfully, the Holy Spirit. Um, when I was in Bible school in, in Saskatoon, I had a guy that, a guy that occasionally would come from one of the local, ch- an independent church, and once in a while he'd be invited to speak in chapel, and he spoke, and, and I was just graduating, just leaving. It was right at the end of the year, and we were having lunch down the dining hall, and he just happened to be sitting at the table, and he was speaking to a bunch of first-year students and, and telling them that what he did was he prepared. He prepared the first half of his sermon, worked hard preparing the first half, and then he just left it, and he counted on the Holy Spirit to give him the rest. And I just couldn't let it go with all these students there. I said, well, man, congratulations. Your half is Always better than the Holy Spirit's. <laughs> that's, that's teaching. Teaching involves that kind of work. Prophecy isn't like that. Prophecy doesn't come from somebody who's a specialist in biblical languages or who's a theologian. It doesn't work like that. Prophecy is God just choosing to speak through someone. 
Remember I talked about the definition of prophecy last week? I'll just do a quick review because to me it's important. Prophecy isn't, isn't, well, I'll get to it eventually, don't worry. So it's not the result of personal study or research directly mediated by the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So that's important. Uh, prophecy, and we're inclined to do this, prophecy doesn't elevate someone to a higher level in the church. Prophecy doesn't mean someone's godlier or holier. Um, just because God uses someone with a prophetic word doesn't mean that uh, they automatically have control over people's lives, can tell people which jobs they should take or who they should marry. or That kind of nonsense floats around periodically in the body of Christ, and it is nonsense, and it shouldn't be given place. It shouldn't be given place at all. Three, the control of the gift of prophecy. The important verses are found in 1 Corinthians 14, 29 to 32. Let, let two or three prophets speak. Okay, so someone in leadership. Paul is writing to someone in leadership in the church, and he's saying, don't allow everybody to do this just whenever they want. That's what Paul's saying. Right? Right? Yeah, okay. Let two or three prophets speak. It doesn't say force, let. Let two or three prophets speak. Let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to one sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. This is the only verse where I guess I said last week, I talked about prophets, Old Testament, apostles, New Testament. We don't have prophets and apostles in that sense. There are prophets in this sense where Paul just recognizes someone who who who's, has a word of prophecy in a service, for that moment, Paul will call him a prophet. But it's not a prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah, because no one ever told Isaiah or Jeremiah, no one ever said, weigh what they said, discern what was said. They spoke with a different kind of authority. But he does recognize that if someone uses the gift of prophecy, you can call him a prophet, small p, in a limited kind of sense. But just from those three verses, here are some things we can glean for sure. Prophecy is not ecstatic or uncontrollable, okay? We know that for sure because the first speaker can easily stop. The Holy Spirit will not force him to keep on speaking. He can just quit. Anytime he wants, he can quit. Two, the prophet is aware of his surroundings and other events. He can know when someone else has something to say and he can shut up. So he can, he can just see what's going on. He's not in some tranced out state. Oh, Michael's... Okay, I'll, I'll be quiet then. He just, he just, he knows, he's aware, he understands what's going on around him. People can easily control when they speak. Paul says we can all speak one by one, and what he means by that is there's no reason for two people to jump up at the same time just uncontrollably, either speaking in tongues, interpretation, or prophecy. There's no reason for that to happen. It doesn't happen very often, but I guess I've, I've seen it once or twice. And it comes from people thinking that those gifts are like a, a holy seizure, and there's just nothing you can do about it. And that's not the case. It's not the case at all. Four, the one giving the prophecy, or D, the one giving the prophecy can actually recognize when the content of his words has drifted off course and needs correction. He'll be humble enough to receive direction, to sit down, let somebody else speak. That's a beautiful thing. I talked about it last week. So all of those things are implied about prophetic utterance just in those three verses. Four, the content of the gift of prophecy The only place where it's really discussed in any detail is, and it's very general, 1 Corinthians 14, 3. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people. He who speaks in an unknown tongue, who does he speak to? God, always. He who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks to God. He who prophesies speaks to people. There's the difference. For their upbuilding encouragement, and consolation. So, prophecy should build up. Prophecy should encourage. Prophecy should console the rest of the body. Now, here's what I take from that.
The gift of prophecy, I won't say never, but the gift of prophecy does not seem to have the emphasis primarily of speaking of future events. That's, that's just the way some people come to think about prophecy because they're thinking of Bible prophecy, the book of Revelation, chapters in Daniel, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, Romans 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. When you read those things, you think it's all about the future. We call those prophetic passages. And so when people hear the gift of prophecy, sometimes that's what they, that's what they think about. They think about Dave Wilkerson and his book, The Vision. Remember The Vision? Anybody? It's a huge seller. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. Three quarters of the things in the vision never happened. You know, you just prophecy and, and, and going into the future beyond the biblical text. It's very dicey stuff. I'm not saying it never, ever, ever happens. I'm just saying Christians need to approach stuff like that with a great deal of care and with a pretty firm handle on what the biblical text says about the future. Because I know Matthew 24 isn't nearly as sensational as a lot of the best sellers on Bible prophecy. But you have to just just be careful about that kind of stuff. So the gift of prophecy is not primarily to predict the future. You do have Agabus, the story of Agabus. Paul's going to Jerusalem. He's with the church. He's taking an offering. The church leaders gather around and they don't want Paul to go. They have a prayer meeting. Agabus, who is a recognized prophet in the church, he speaks and he says, Paul, here's what's going to happen to you when you go to Jerusalem. And he takes his belt and he binds up his hands and his feet and he says, Paul, when you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. Okay? So the disciples hear this, and the disciples all say, Paul, don't go. Don't go. So, a couple of questions come out of that. Agabus. Did Agabus do the right thing with this prophetic word? Let's start there. How many say yeah? I would be inclined to agree. He did the right thing. Was it the Lord? Agreed? Did it end up pretty much, not quite, if you read carefully, but pretty much, which remember we all prophesy in part, did it end up pretty much the way Agabus said? Yeah, it did. Was Paul right in going anyway? See, a lot of people have a hard time with that. Here you have this recognized prophet speaking by the Lord. Details are pretty much accurate. The whole church hears it. And then the, it's not, technically it's not Agabus to give him credit. But the rest of the disciples, they say, Paul, don't go. Don't go, Paul. Paul says, well, I have to go. Okay. So the purpose of prophecy. What is the purpose of prophecy? Well, encouragement, consolation, building up. So here's what, here's what the Holy Spirit was doing. And the church didn't recognize it. By and large, the church didn't recognize it. What God was doing was not saying, Paul, don't go. What God was doing was saying, Paul, be ready for this. Yeah, don't suck it up. Rely on me. I'll be with you. I think, here's what I think. It's a very beautiful way of, of God saying to Paul through the prophet, just because this happens to you, I'm showing it to you in advance so that you'll know this situation hasn't slipped out of my hands. That's what God was doing. I'm showing you this in advance so that when you go and it happens, you're going to have this to look back on and say, God knew all along. He knows where I am. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He's with me. So I take that to be a beautiful example, actually, of God bringing consolation and encouragement to the church. But, it, but prophecy doesn't carry the kind of weight where just because someone has a prophecy, um, Paul knew that he was called, Paul knew he was called to go to Jerusalem. Like he knew God was calling him. And it's to his credit that he doesn't allow somebody in a meeting somewhere to say, oh, God showed me you're not... Like, don't let anybody else be Jesus for you. Just let Jesus be Jesus to you. Let him speak to your heart. Let him show you in his word. 
If you get advice and counsel from the church and friends, that's fine. But, but always let Jesus be Jesus to you. B, the gift of prophecy is not given to instruct in church doctrine. That is why the early church, while embracing the gift of prophecy, was governed by the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to prophetic words. No. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. So that's why when you come to uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, get into some of the pastoral epistles where Paul knows, Paul knows he's fading off the scene. They're the last, they're the last letters Paul wrote. He knows that he's going to die soon, and there's the church going to be left without any apostles anymore. They're dying off. And we can't imagine the kind of transition that would be. All of a sudden, all of the original apostles are dead and gone. And that's why when Paul says, Paul says, Timothy, you need to have leaders in the church. It's in 1st, 2nd Timothy. It's in Titus. Uh, when you have leaders in the church, they have to be teachers. They don't have to be prophets. They have to be teachers. Why? Well, because the church is going to be regulated by the apostles' doctrine, which will talk about the gift of prophecy like the Bible does, but they're regulated by the apostles' teaching. We get that the way Paul says, never mind a prophet, he says, if you're standing there Sunday morning in your worship service and an angel comes down through the ceiling, stands right behind the pulpit and gives you instructions contrary to Scripture, Paul says, let him be accursed. We're not comfortable with the language, what, what Paul really means there, but that, that's, that's what Paul's saying. It doesn't matter how sensational it is. If it departs from the apostles' doctrine. C, gift of prophecy is to bring the specific help of God to specific needs in that local body that no one will know about apart from specific prophetic revelation. It can be used by the Holy Spirit to meet the spiritual needs even of the unsaved. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 24, 25. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed... And so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God was really among you. I uh, have only had this happen a couple times in my, my life. But I have had a couple situations where that verse just comes to my mind, where, where on a, a Monday or a Tuesday, someone will phone and say, can I come by and see you? And they'll come by and they'll sit in my office, and it's someone that just gave their heart to the Lord. That Sunday, they came to church unsaved, and they gave their heart to the Lord. And, and to, my, to my surprise, they'll say something about, and I, you know, I'm not thinking of a specific situation right now, but they'll, they'll say, you told that story, you gave an example about someone who was doing such and such and such and such, and, and how, you know, even in that kind of a situation, God might speak to them and call them to himself. And then they'll say, how did you, I don't know how you knew that was me, because that was that week, I was there, I was in that spot, I was doing that, and, 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 and when you use that illustration... You were talking specifically about me. And that's not because I'm some kind of genius. I think there are probably moments where the Holy Spirit just kind of, in spite of me, <laughs> the Holy Spirit gets in there and talks to someone who isn't even a Christian and just uses something and the secrets of his heart are laid bare. And I didn't know anything about it. And then they give their hearts to Jesus. And that's just a beautiful thing. Now, the Holy Spirit has to do that. There's not a Bible text in the world that's going to address someone by name and say a place where they were that week and a situation they were facing. There's not a Bible verse in the world. That, that's, that's something different that the Holy Spirit does. All right, what can I do? Five. How can I involve and stretch myself in the ministry of the gifts of the Spirit? I'm thinking specifically today about prophecy, but this is any of them. Um, I have four thoughts. First, attend church regularly. 
You know, the old King James still talks about the 120 in the upper room and they were all together in one accord. And if you want the Holy Spirit to work with the church, the church has to be together. Together in one place. Get used to, get used to the feel of your local church. Get used to the style of how they worship. Get used to what will flow and function in that congregation and what will just be jarring in that. I'm not talking now about right or wrong. I'm not saying something is wrong. I'm saying something would fit in another church that might not fit in this church. There are churches that have totally different sets of practices and standards. You know what? There are churches where um, I can think of a church where I went and visited. It would just be an unloving thing because I know the church, I know the style of their worship, I know what they believe. It would just be a proud, unloving act for me to stand second row to the front in this church and when they start singing a hymn, just start to worship and praise God because I know they don't go for that there. Now you can say, well, I just have to be true to myself. No, 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 no. There's a body there of people Jesus loves, you know. And I'm not out to just upset them. Sure, I can take out a text and argue with them about the validity of raising hands in worship, but not there. Just, just find a way that fits in with what they're doing. Now, when you're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, okay, so obviously you're going to be in a church that at least believes in that. I'll tell you, you stand up, you stand up in John MacArthur's church on a Sunday night with a word of prophecy, you're not going to finish it. <laughs> If you got a word of prophecy in his church Sunday night, make it a quick one, you know. <laughs> Love Jesus, thank you, Boom, and you're gone. Okay. <laughs> but you'll get a feel, you'll get a feel for uh, how the Holy Spirit works in different congregations. Because remember, it's a mixture human and divine. We're people, we're people with egos. We're people with biases. We're people with certain points of understanding. We're people that haven't grown in understanding in certain areas. All that comes into play. Uh, attend church regularly. They're corporate gifts. They aren't given to bless you. They are given for the church. Get a feel for the congregation. Get a feel for the congregation. Two. Two. Even, even, by the way, sorry, but even the flow of a service, when you get to know, okay, here's how it works in Cedar, but here's where they'll have prayer times, here's where there might be a break in the worship, a good time for a prophetic word, obviously isn't right before the choir sings, you know, when they're changing lights and people are moving, that isn't going to work, you, you'll just start to feel, sometimes, oh, sometimes they're praying around the front, and sometimes at the close, Pastor Don will just stand and wait 15, 20 seconds, oh, that'd be, and you know it's coming. You know, you get a feel for how that service flows, how they tend to do things in that church. B, prepare your heart through prayer. Make it a part of your Lord's Day preparation. Stay inwardly alert. Believe God may want to work through you. Don't let your mind grow numb or wayward during the service. Fill your mind with the Word. Be informed especially about the gifts of the Spirit, what they're like and what they're for. That is the whole reason we stayed so long with this subject. It is usually almost totally ignored in the teaching ministry of the church. Knowing what the Word says will help you to recognize what the voice of God sounds like. This will give you a standard by which you can measure thoughts and impulses. For remember at some point that all the gifts require a responsive step of faith. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our Faith. In other words, gifts don't just happen. You will never be forced by the Spirit to minister prophetically or in any other way. Each time, you have to trust the Spirit's leading afresh. My suggestion is, is if, you, if you pray about it and think about it, find, find a smaller group setting. There are all sorts of them. And kind of grow in, grow in those ministries. God wants to bless the church, edify others through you. We'll talk about it more next week. 